Friends, at this time, I would ask you uh, all to ensure that your cell phones are on some sort of silent mode, please. Good afternoon. In our tradition, when we hear that somebody has died, we respond to the news that they died with three words of blessing. In English, those words mean praised is the judge of truth. Please repeat the wisdom of our tradition after me. Baruch, Dayan, Ha'emet. Praise is God the judge of truth. It's somewhat curious that we've made the decision historically to begin a funeral service with a word of blessing, and specifically a word of blessing of God as a judge of truth. Why do we do this? Well, first and foremost, I imagine our teachers, our rabbis, understood that even in a difficult moment like this, we have to be able to summon the strength to celebrate a life. As I sat yesterday afternoon with the family and we talked a little bit about Elaine, there were moments of tears, but there were also some wonderful moments of laughter, some wonderful smiles, some incredible reflections of an incredible life. And so even though this is a moment of sadness, even though this is a moment maybe of longing and maybe even a little bit of some anger, we still have to be appreciative of the blessing of a life. We still have to be appreciative of the time that somebody like Elaine walked this earth, and in so doing, 
We honor her, and we keep her alive after today. Friends, in our tradition, when we're unable to summon the words to accurately express how we feel, we turn to the words of our psalms. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters and restores my soul. God guides me in straight paths for God's name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. The psalmist says, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil, for you are with me. What is the valley of the shadow of death? Well, that's the place, the time, the space, that we all occupy in this exact moment, especially Elaine's beloved family. It's the world after we lose somebody who is important, who is fundamental to the human beings, to the people that we are in this given moment. Why is it that we don't fear? You might say the natural assumption would be that God is with us, and I'm sure that that's a piece of the meaning. But I also know that the psalmist had to be alluding to the fact that just because we don't have a physical presence in this world doesn't mean that we can't hear the person. We can't see them. As you will hear today, in the coming days, Elaine had a very strong presence in her family. I think that's a fair fair, not overestimating statement to say. I might even just be underselling it a little bit. Strong might not do it justice. But because of that, as you will see and hear, Elaine's presence will continue to be strong long after she This morning, you texted me, Wendy, to add one last thing. And it dawned on me as I was reading that text that maybe a little of great minds think alike. But also that the text was actually how I had chosen to begin the service this morning. Which is to say that whatever happened in Elaine's life, whatever story there may be, the truth, and remember we started this service with a blessing about the truth, the truth is that Elaine's life started, stopped, and ended with that. That was what was most important to Elaine, day in and day out. And so it's only appropriate that we begin this afternoon with some reflections from family members. We begin with the person who made Elaine a grandmother for the first time. sure that I wanted to speak today. In fact, I really wasn't sure I could. I decided yesterday I was going to ask someone else to do it. But then I heard my mom's voice in the back of my head. Hold it. <laughs> Just a minute. You're not going to speak? <laughs> well, I, I guess I just thought you'd speak. 
like, all right, it's okay if you don't want to. I just really thought that you would. <laughs> um, okay, 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 my mom, I get it. I'll speak. And so I speak. I stand up here in front of the people that know her and love her. And I talk about... the most incredible woman I have been blessed to know and love. Most of you knew Elaine as a wife or a mother or a friend or a scratch golfer or a canasta shark, but my cousin, siblings, daughter, and I knew her as Mama. Our pink-wearing, egg-salad-making, ever-present Mama. She was always just so proud of and excited for each one of us. Every milestone, every accomplishment. My mom was always at every graduation, every sports game, every recital, and every birthday party. Anytime we missed her or needed her, she was there. Our success was her success. Our joy was her joy. And our pain was her pain. She was always the first to congratulate us or comfort us, and she was really good at it. Mama was known for a lot, a lot of things. Her dust busting and floor mopping, her list making, her greeting cards she would write and send out so that they would arrive exactly on your birthday or for Rosh Hashanah. Her impeccable memory the way she would remember if I had a test or a doctor's appointment and call to ask me how it went immediately after. How she moved me into college, my first apartment, the first home that Jason and I bought, and meticulously unpacked and put away our dishes and cutlery and organized our closets better than we ever could have. Her selflessness how it brought her so much joy to shop for or do for others. The past few years were challenging, to say the least, for our mom as she battled cancer. And battle truly is the right word, because surprising to no one, through chemo, radiation, countless doctor's appointments, and pain, Mama maintained an incredible positive attitude and didn't slow down one bit spending time with her loving family, from pumpkin carving at our house with Avery to meeting her adorable great-grandson, Julian, in Queenstown. And to one last special LBI vacation with the Harps. We all describe Mama as an ox. She has never let anything slow her down. And cancer was no exception. You would never know she was suffering. I think my brother said it best when he said, Mama is so strong that it's intimidating. <laughs> we would all be lucky to have a quarter of her grit. This summer, I sat with her and we talked about our love languages, the most meaningful ways that we show and, re and receive love. It's always been clear to me that Mama valued quality time above all else more than gifts or words of affirmation or anything. And I think this is part of the reason we've always been so close. It's because above all else, I chose to spend time with her and Gramps. And like so many of you, I love spending every second that I could with her. I didn't take our relationship for granted for one second. I feel like the luckiest girl in the world. I got to spend 33 years of my life loving and being loved by my mom. And what's even more special is my incredible husband, Jason, and my sweet daughter, Avery, were blessed with their own unique relationships with her. Watching Mom and Avery tubing two summers ago 
right before my mom's 80th birthday, watching them play Barbies and sing together and really just being together is and always will be one of the greatest joys of my whole life. COVID has been challenging for <laughs> us all, but I am filled with gratitude to have spent the last two summers with her in Queenstown. To wake up and to have coffee with her every day, to watch her blonde hair blow as she rode on the boat, to watch her mother, my mother, and my aunts, to help her wasn't when she wasn't as strong and couldn't do for herself. Avery, Jason, and I went to Florida last Thursday because we missed her and we wanted to see her. I can't stop thinking about how blessed I feel to have listened to my gut saying it was time for us to go see her. Before we left on Sunday, I held her little I held her little face in my hands and I kissed her lips and I smiled at her. And she smiled right back at me. And there was nothing else that needed to be said. I can't begin to describe the void I feel, we all feel, without her here physically, but I know she'll be with me and with all of us everywhere we go. Thank you. One of the important things to tell you about Elaine is that she loved everybody in her family and she had no favorites whatsoever. But technically Mark was her favorite. <laughs> You'll have to figure out how she had no favorites and technically Mark was her favorite. That's on you. But Mark is going to share some words. No, it was an honor to, to, yeah, definitely she had a lot of favorites, and not sure I was there, but for almost 40 years, we just, you know, from the first time we met, we just, uh, you know, had a great, great bond, uh, it was just uh, mutual respect, mutual admiration, and just the ability really just to talk back and forth uh, about anything, and, and, and it, it's great, and we just we got along great, it was she laughed at my jokes. Not many people do that. She, you know, I, I, I like to make a mess. She liked to clean up messes. Uh, she would do, take a nap. I would run in to take a nap. And I think she was only one of two people in the entire world that thought that the speech that uh, I gave at Aaron's wedding, along with my mom, was too short. I think really, <laughs> thought it went a little over. Um, but first, to thank you to really everybody here for the outpouring, the absolute outpouring of love. I think. You know, speaking for, 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 for Wendy and Dory and Robin and our entire family, the, the cards, the texts, the calls, the Facebook posts. I mean, it's just these things, we look at them and we send them around and they, it just makes this very tough time that much easier. And the pictures that come in, so please don't stop sending to them. I think it's just going to continue to prolong the great memories I think we all have. So, you know, life events, like Aaron said, didn't, didn't miss any. And, and she just, you know, she knew... Not only us, obviously her family, but she knew our friends, and, and, and our friends were her friends, and then our kids' friends were her friends. I mean, it was, you know, she knew Sam Harf's crew, Luke and Ruff, and, and, and Andrew Stein I mean, had his own special relationship with her. So it's just, it was, and no, nobody knew her as Elaine. If you said Elaine, they probably didn't know who you were talking about. If you said Mrs. Plant, they didn't know who you were talking about. When you said Mom, Mom, that's who they knew, and that's how everybody knew her was Mom. Mom. So four years ago, just about four years ago, she gets this diagnosis, and, and, and it was a terrible diagnosis. I mean, it was, you know, some pains, uh, lower abdomen pains one day, and next thing you know, it's the most, you know, aggressive, really deadly cancer, ovarian cancer that's out there. And it's just, there, there's no cure, it's fast acting, it, it, it's just the worst you could get. And, you know, she, she, she just said, okay, how are we going to deal with this? It wasn't, woe is me. It was, what can we do? Because I'm not going anywhere. And she wasn't going anywhere. And this was a woman who lost her mom at a very young age. And I think that was probably one of the things in her history that gave her that sense of resolve and, and just made her that strong person who she really was. 
and, and that got her, and, and she was really not concerned about her. She was concerned about everybody around her <laughs> being down about what she had. And she was the one that was consistently lifting everybody up. And she'd go to the treatments and, and come back and, hey, how was it, Mom? Are you okay? Uh, never complain. Never complain. It's how are you doing? How are you doing? What's going on with you? When are we going to see each other next? Um, it was just, it was never woe is me. And, you know, she was getting massive doses of chemo, enough to, you know, knock just anybody out, but it didn't stop the trips to LBI, it didn't stop the trips to Arizona to see Wendy and the boys, and it didn't stop her coming down and just hanging out each summer, you know, with, with, with us, with our kids, with the grandkids, with my mom, my sisters, it was just, it was, it was just, you know, it was just business as usual, I mean, if, if you didn't know it, you wouldn't know it, and, you know, with that diagnosis, it, it really took a village to come together and, and, and really support it, and, you know, here's, you know, these are the queens of the village right here. Uh, you know, Wendy, Robin, and Dory, just, uh, you know, unbelievable rocks. And then everybody else. I mean, she had, you know, friends from Florida, friends from Baltimore all picked in. You know, Rhoda and Stanley and Todd were constant, keep checking in. I mean, Susan, Jerry, I, you know, I put you in the family category because you're our family. And uh, they were just, you know, just, just rocks, rock stars. The, the, the plant kids... Um, came back and forth to see her, uh, continued to check in with her all the time. Their kids checked in with her all the time. I mean, it was just unbelievable. You know, her grandchildren, you know, Aaron, Scott, Corey, Mike, Colleen, Eric, Ryan, Sam, Matt, just, we just, we had her phone and we're just looking at after her. And it's just, there's just nonstop texts from the grandkids. How you doing, Mom? Mom, what's going on, Mom? Give me a call and get a chance. The videos are going back and forth. These are the things that you know, this was the chemo that worked for her. And this is the thing that took somebody that probably had six months and took it almost up to four years, which was just, just a tribute to everybody in here was that love was really the medicine that she needed. And, you know, like I said, I started and, and, and it's, it's the daughters. I mean, you guys, you guys let it. I mean, Robin was the absolute general and there wasn't a doctor's appointment that she didn't go to. Um, they couldn't tell her one thing without 20 questions back. Wendy and Dory were there by her side, everything. They just picked each other up the entire time. And, and it's, it's, it's just, you know, I just look back and I think everybody just said how amazing that was. And, you, you know, you and you and everybody else really extended her life by years when really medically she shouldn't have done that. So, you know, we all kind of hope, I think, one day that when we leave that there's some type of legacy we leave. And, Clearly, whether she wanted to believe it or not, she she absolutely you know left the legacy. I mean, her legacy was family devotion. It just um, she she treasured every moment with every kid, uh, with every grandkid, with sons, son-in-laws, cousins, friends, and just had a way of making us all feel like you know we were her favorite. And and I guess that was me. But. <laughs> <laughs> and then she was you know in in this world where there's just. Boy, it's just you, all you read about the world out there. There's so many takers, and everybody's taken, and they want this, and they want that. She was on the other side of the fence. She was a giver. I mean, it's what can I do for you? How can I help you? What can I do? Where, you know, the presence, the card, she never missed anything. I mean, and that continued. This, like Aaron talked, the, they were down there, so she passed on Monday. On Sunday, you know, she gave Abe the necklace she's wearing, uh, you know, because she just would continue to give. She passed on Monday, but Monday morning, she was at the store with Wendy buying Susie Reitmeister a birthday present just to make sure she, she got that down. And, and probably one of the biggest gifts I think that she gave was that when it turned out to be it was her time, it just, it wasn't going to be a big production anymore. It wasn't going to be anybody watching her suffering and then in, in response suffering along with her. It was, it, it was amazingly quick. And, and it was almost when she took that turn for the worst, she just said, this is it. And, and, and that was it. She was at peace. You know, and, and, and we were all there in spirit with her. Um, the last, you know, it was just love coming out of her mouth. And, and, and that's that's how we'll remember her. And that's just, it's great. So, you know, whether she knew it or not, she was an incredible role model. I think probably as we go on in life, we're going to realize how incredible a role model it was. Uh, family devotion and giving. I mean, either one of those is a tremendous legacy you can give. But, but both of them, I mean, I think that's a playbook that we all probably could try and follow. Thanks, Thank
have to admit, I was a little surprised when the brown girls wanted me to speak. Because, as everybody knows, I'm unscripted. For those of you who know me, I'm an unscripted human being. So, the general dis... No, I'm not going to fall down. The general disclaimer is being put out there. So, I think they warned you that my language sometimes is a little on the salty side. So, the... When Dory came to me and said, are you going to speak? My initial reaction was, I don't really like talking in front of large populations, even though I sort of speak to people for a living. And I don't particularly, my mother knows, I don't like funerals. So no one likes funerals, but I particularly dislike them. But I thought about why I think that Dory, Robin, and Wendy wanted me to speak. And then that sort of kind of resonated with me. So Elaine was all about family. That was it. I mean, no, nothing personal to anybody else around her who was a friend, because she was a good friend. But Elaine's sole focus was her family. And she had a really large family that grew over long periods of time. And everybody was treated basically the same, except one. <laughs> so, and we all learned to come to accept that. And her, that drive about her family was so intrinsic. And Wendy said something this morning when we were having, having a cup of coffee that, you know, I think because mom lost her mother so early in life that it created just a generalized, fo single focus on her family. And I think sometimes that, you would think that that, that concept could become one track and become oppressive and too much, con and, and sometimes too much. And she had this uh, uh, ability not to do that. And I think, to me, that is a, was her, maybe her most, her greatest gift as a mother. She was involved, but she never overstepped her bounds. And she, I, one of the things that will always <laughs> resonate in my head is her saying to me, I never want to be a burden. I never want to, I never really want to interfere. And she lived by that. Now, you know, when you People talk about people's lives. They talk about some of the funny things. And yes, we'll miss the grunting and the, and the basically the reincarnation of a seven-year-old who broke into Dylan's candy shop and had incessant energy all day. <laughs> and the fact that sometimes it wasn't always good to talk to her after 5.30 in, in the afternoon. But, but, the, but the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that her focus was so on her family and she was able to create a, a tremendous balance with all of these people. I mean, she had stepkids and grandkids and all grandkids and a great kid, kid and nobody ever felt neglected. So, to me, that was really her greatest gift. Now, I, on a pure personal level, am going to miss Elaine for one specific reason. <laughs> Who is going to save me from Dory? <laughs> we because, will. We will. We got you. <laughs> taking applications. So, the, one of the big jokes was that Dory, oh, Dory's niceness to me and the kids always rose up when Elaine was in, and it's based on what I think Wendy likes to describe as fearing the wrath of E. <laughs> she had a wrath, wasn't, but only directed towards her girls. That was it. I, I never felt it. I know Mark never felt it because he was the favorite. So, but, and that was an amazing thing to me because in the 20 years that I knew the woman, I don't think she ever sided with Dory in a fight that I had. <laughs> Not one. I want to go on a golf trip. What are you giving him a hard time about? <laughs> the boys are watching incessant amounts of football when they're supposed to be in homework. Leave them alone. <laughs> gonna miss that because it makes life it made life a little bit easier and it didn't interfere with my golf game. So <laughs> it was that balance that really made her uh, an incredibly special woman. Now when Elaine was diagnosed she kind of joined the fraternity that I had belonged to and nothing personal about everyone who said you know I feel how are you how feel how you feel if you don't go through it and you're really not in the fraternity. And she and I had conversations that I'm reasonably sure 
even her daughters don't know about it. Because we told each other we would never talk about it. She was incredibly optimistic about her diagnosis, despite the fact that, as Jerry and I have been discussing since the day of the diagnosis, she had no real basis to be optimistic about it. But she was the toughest woman I have ever met. I mean, up until only a few weeks ago, she effectively was living her life as if she never had cancer. She had, a, as Mark said, she had a bad form of cancer that should have been debilitating. Her strength and her desire to live her life and to be with her girls and everybody else drove her to make the best of what really should have been a horrific situation. And I didn't notice until, I guess it was about two or three weeks ago, when she called me after they decided they were going to stop doing the chemo, and she wanted to thank me for letting Dory come down, which I thought was an utterly ridiculous conversation, but and it is it, that's what she did. And we started talking, and she's like, you know, you let her, you, you know, I can't thank you enough for allowing Dory to come down here, and I didn't allow her to do anything she was going to go, even though I told her she couldn't go, she didn't but I said, what do you think? Is what she goes, you know, my girls have been so unbelievable that I feel fulfilled. And then she stopped and said, I don't know why I deserve that. And I kind of laughed. And she said, what's so funny? I said, they're just being you. And that's really the truth. So you should go to the Brown girls, you should go to your mother's funeral knowing how much she loved you. There was nothing more that you could have said to make her know that. And that you're the reincarnation of her. <laughs> Except the grunting. <laughs> going to take a few minutes to um, fill in some of the details and points of Elaine's life, but first I want to caution the family for a moment. There are a lot of people in your immediate sphere who are claiming to have shared a lot of secrets with Elaine. <laughs> Somewhere those secrets are going to match, and my sense is you're going to spend the next month trying to figure out who knows what because I've heard that about four or five times now, that Elaine shared secrets. I, makes me kind of think and wonder whether or not Elaine was the grandmaster of it all <laughs> and knew exactly which secrets she was sharing with everybody, but at the end, probably got all of you to share all of the secrets. So there she was in the middle of it all, holding all of the information and all of you thinking that you were the only ones that knew. Friends, as we were sitting yesterday with the family, I was struck by something that Elaine's godson, Todd, said. Todd, you referred to Elaine as the matriarch. It's ironic that you said this, because I think in so many ways it was an apt description. Right now, in our Jewish communities, we are reading the stories of Genesis, the first book of the Torah five books of Moses. If you look at the matriarchs, they all have a few things in common. First of all, they have really challenging lives. They seem to go from place to place. They are constantly, constantly supporting their husband. They are constantly coming to the aid of and helping their children. And they are constantly, again and again, called to overcome tragedy, conflict, challenge, no matter what may face, no matter what they may face, in an effort to build a nation, to build a community. Elaine was, in that way, the quintessential matriarch. You've heard she did not have an easy life. She did not. And yet, through it all, she managed to build this incredible family, this incredible community of friends, and build a legacy that will exist long after today. Elaine Kaplan Plant, 
was born in Baltimore in 1940 on January 2nd. She had the birthday first. Dory came by at second. She was the daughter of Samuel, or Mickey, and Dorothy, and had one sister. As you've heard, her mom died when she was just 17. And that is probably why you could often hear Elaine say, come hell or high water, she was going to be there, no matter what it was. Small moments and big moments alike. Elaine's dad fired her from his poultry store after less than one day of work. <laughs> that should not confuse you and make you think that they did not have a good relationship. They had a wonderful relationship. The story goes, it was the first day of work and she took an hour lunch break for Hanukkah gifts. When she returned from the hour-long lunch break, she was fired. Growing up, Elaine was a tomboy, but she was very beautiful and very popular. After an 18-year marriage, the beauty that she got from it were her three daughters. You've heard a lot about her three girls today. But let's hear from them a little bit about Elaine. Robin, you said she was strict, but incredibly fair. A stay-at-home mom, your best friend. But of course, each of you at some point when you wanted to tell her something, had to go to Aunt Rhoda first, <laughs> so that Aunt Rhoda could help at least soften the message of what was coming. Aunt Rhoda only got married in the end because Elaine approved of the wedding, and had she not, who knows what would have been. Wendy, you talked about how your mom would jump her drawers in the middle of the room so that they would stay neat. Apparently, Dory didn't uh, have that same problem. But neatness was imperative. She was a little bit of an obsessive cleaner. If you got up at 6 a.m. to go to the bathroom, by the time you returned from the bathroom, your bed was freshly, freshly clean. But even with a little bit of jesting, what struck me so beautifully about our conversation yesterday was how each of you came alive when you talked about what it meant to you to see her name come up on your cell phone how that brought a smile to you, how that warmed your heart, how hearing her voice or telling you how wonderful her children are just brought something extra to your day. It's hard to imagine without her being able to call you that you will still have that. But Robin, Wendy, Dory, you will still have that. Her voice is still in your head. And in the quiet moments, when you need to ask her a question, you'll be able to hear it. I cannot guarantee that you're going to like the answer. <laughs> it's at least if you're being honest. But it's a voice that you will be able to hear. In 1976, she met Arnold Plant, and that brought in to the family Harry, Debbie, and Larry. Not the easiest to meld two families together, but as you heard from Mark, it's become like family, like it was there all along, loving, supportive. And the truth is, in the few times I spoke to Elaine, she loved to talk about Larry to me. Larry did this, Larry did that, Larry took me here. She was very proud of that. You've heard about Mama. And you've heard a little bit about how she became mum to other people. But as we were sitting yesterday, and Erin was explaining to me that some of her childhood friends' kids also called Elaine mum. They have no earthly relationship, if you can picture that in your mind. Elaine really was a mum to all. And what an incredible gift that is. Think about it for a moment. Sometimes younger people are embarrassed or don't necessarily want older, more experienced generations around them. But Elaine not only was somebody who her grandkids wanted around, but her grandkids constantly would be in touch with her. 
texting her, saying hello to her, telling her what they're doing. And my guess is that all six of the extended plant brown children, probably in your conversations with Elaine, heard a great deal uh, just about how wonderful those grandchildren actually were. When we were sitting yesterday, we also got the opportunity to talk with Susie and Jerry, beloved neighbors, friends, chief health advisor, bonding over intense cleaning, but at the end of the day, incredible, incredible family and incredible, incredible relationships. When you think about it, Elaine was adept at creating relationships, relationships that were unique. Each of you talked about something unique in your relationship with Elaine when we sat yesterday. That's an incredible gift. What an incredible legacy that she leaves. Rhoda, you said yesterday that you feel like a part of you is gone. You guys did everything and would have done anything for each other. But at the end of the day, Elaine's story is a story about family and a story about great success. What describes or marks a successful life? We might be tempted to think in this world that what marks a successful life are the things that we attain, what we acquire along the way. But the reality is, what really marks a successful life is who we have in our lives. The relationships that we develop while we're here, that's where we leave a legacy. That's where we leave a memory. Erin, you talked about a big void. It is impossible not to have a void given Elaine's passing. But in thinking about that void, I'm thinking about a story about a day exactly like today. Today is a bright, beautiful fall day. The leaves are changing. We're seeing the beautiful colors. And I think of a story of two 10-year-old children walking through a forest on a day like today. One of the children sees the leaves, sees all of the beautiful colors, and immediately becomes sad. They're sad that it's no longer summer, that school is here, and they can no longer run and play and have fun. The other child looks at the exact same picture and is incredibly joyful. The memories of everything that child got to do during the summer brings them joy. It warms their heart. And that's what sustains them. And in a way, that day, that challenge is what we, is what the family faces today. Right now, in the immediacy of Elaine's loss, it's hard. It's hard to focus on the wonderful memories, and it's hard not to focus on the void. But in the coming days, weeks, months ahead, we fill that void, and we start to focus on the memories, on all of the stories, and that void is filled with those stories, filled with the anecdotes, filled with everything that we were able to do with Elaine while she was here in this world. And in so doing, we ensure that the memory of Elaine Plant will always serve as a blessing. And so, to Erin, to let me get everybody here. <laughs> To, uh, I was about to, call this group. to Robin, Mark, Aaron, Jason, Scott, Wendy, Michael, and Colleen, Eric, Dory, Stephen, Sam, Matt, Harry, Amy, Ethan, Isaac, Matthew, Anna, Alex, Debbie, Dennis, Natalie, Noah, Celine, Larry, Morgan, Nolan, Olivia, and great grandchildren, Avery, and Julian. We offer the hope and prayer that Elaine's blessing should always serve as an inspiration and as a blessing in this world. Dehi nishmata brucha. May the memory and soul of Elaine Plant always be for a lasting blessing. And let us all say, Amen. At this point, friends, we conduct the Jewish burial service. In a moment, the family is going to come forward and shovel a little bit of dirt onto the coffin. There are those of you who will wish to engage in this ritual as well, we'll ask that you wait until after the funeral services. 
Sometimes we look at this moment, this physical act, as little more than just shoveling a little bit of dirt onto a coffin, which is in essence what we do. But this is an incredibly important act, an incredibly important moment. Why? Well, first and foremost, doing this is done out of pure goodness, out of love. This deed that the family that you do for Elaine is something that she can never do for you in return. There's no ulterior motive, no notion that somehow this deed will be repaid. In addition, if you think back to when you were a little child and you didn't want to go to sleep, somehow if a loved one, a parent, a friend, a relative would tuck you in, somehow it would make that sleep feel a little safer, maybe a little bit more peaceful. And what we do today is we tuck Elaine in for that everlasting sleep. Not because we want to, but in the hopes that this act of love, this act of devotion, will help make that sleep be a little safer and a little peaceful. So we're going to start Al Mekomata Vobis Shalom. May Elaine Kaplan Plant go unto God in peace.
friends, in a moment we're going to conclude with the memorial prayer and mourner's cottage. The Hebrew prayer for the departed. El Malay Rahamim Shokhen Ba Miromim Hamse Minuchan Echona Tachat Kanfe Ashkina Bimalot Kidoshim Utorim Kizaraki Amazirim Et Nishmat Itarezo Bachmo Vidbora Shahalolama Began and the Hemenuchata Anabala Rachamim has to have a Seder Knafecha Leolamim Utsuror beats Rachaim and Nishmata Adonai Nakalata Vitanua Fishaloma Mishkava Vinomar Amen. Exalted, compassionate God, for an infinite rest your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of Elaine Kaplan Plant who has gone to her eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that our loved one find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May her soul be bound up in the bonds of everlasting life. May she rest in peace and let us all say, Amen. Amen. We now recite the mourner's cottage. Yitgadal ve Yitgadash Shime Raba ve Alma Divra Kirote ve Yamlich Malchute ve Chayechon Vyomechon Ubchaye de Chol ve Israel ba Gala Uvizman Kariv ve Imru Amen Yehesh Me Raba Mivarach la Alam Lameo Maya Yit Barach Ve Yishtabach, Ve Yitvahar, Ve Yitromam, Ve Yitnaseh, Ve Yitadar, Ve Yitaleh, Ve Yitalal, Shmei Dekudsha Berichu, Le'ela Minkol Birchata Veshirata, Tushbechata Venechemata, Damiran Be'alma Ve'imru, Amen. Yehesh Lama Rabba Min Shemayim, the Chaim Aleno ve al Kol Yisrael ve Imru Amen. O se Shalom bim Ramav, Uya se Shalom. Aleno ve al Kol Yisrael ve Imru. Friends, following funeral services today, the family will be returning to the late residence, Three Talton Court in Baltimore. Services this evening at 7 p.m. and then again sitting Shiva tomorrow from 12. 
to five. As we close the funeral service and we begin the healing and the mourning process, a big piece of that is perpetuating the ideals, the legacies of Elaine's life. You've heard about Elaine's focus on family. It seems like such an obvious thing to make family a priority in our lives. And yet, too often we probably don't make that decision. So as we stand here today and celebrate Elaine's life, as you think about your own life, the next time where you have a decision or a choice to prioritize family or to do something else, prioritize family. And when you do it, think of Elaine. And together, as a family, as a community of mourners, we will keep her legacy and her presence alive in this world. And so to the family, we offer the following greeting. HaMakom Yenachem Etchem B'toch She'ar Avelei Tzion V'Yerushalayim May God have comfort upon you through the power of family, of love and community, as God has done for all the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. And we all say, May the memory of Elaine Kaplan plant always be for a lasting blessing. Amen. Friends, thank you all for coming today. <laughs> At Nishmat, it a rezo, bachmo, vid bora, shahalo lama, begane, den de hemenu kata, Anabala rachami, must you have a satyr knafe haleo lamim, Utsuror bits rachaim and Nishmata, Adonai lunakalata, vitanua, fishaloma, mishkava, Vinomar, Amen.